changed a little bit, but while we're so Susanna, I'll like invite you Susanna and Anita up here for the Q&A. Uh, that's the microphone for you, Susanna. And Anita, do you still have yours? Or did you throw it away? I've got it. Kadim will help us. Please uh, come up and um, I would like to suggest uh, while we are kind of changing, please. Um, while we are kind of changing the, the scene, um, so I guess just try to create a little bit of a summary or some kind of a, um, boiling it down in a very violent way, I'm sure, for your, <laughs> for your very detailed and intricate uh, theory. But as I understand it, um, you're inviting us to, to, to meditate and, and think completely differently, first and foremost, to, to look beyond or behind or underneath or to the sides of what traditional Western or Enlightenment philosophy has taught us about, first and foremost, putting the human in the center of our world understanding, but also putting the human in the center in, with the use of time. So understanding also the development of the world, the development of the human, in, in the context of universal time, or what we might also call history, perhaps. Um, and what you're inviting us to do further is to, I guess, ground ourselves or, or meditate um, on a concept of being. So instead of thinking ourselves as human first and foremost, we are being. Uh, in this world, and we are beings, I guess. Um, but at least meditating on ourselves as, as, as first and foremost as being in the world, instead of being something specific. Um, it's our existence, perhaps. But this, uh, I see you thinking, so hopefully you can correct me. Um, and then for the last part, uh, the title for this conversation and for this, uh, for this talk was on heat, and um, you also invited us to, instead of uh, understanding the world from a human perspective through, you know, the specific object, for example, and specifically also objects that have been created or objects and how they they look to us and how we can use them, um, we can meditate on being in the world from a perspective of uh, of these elements of these four elements that, that, that you mentioned, water, fire, earth, um, air. And uh, today maybe it will be conducive for us to, to talk about um, the element of fire, or at least fire and heat. <clears throat> I don't know if those things are exactly the same. Um, I'm looking at the, the scientist over here, so I'm sure she has uh, some ideas on that as well. Um, to kind of correlate, to, to create a connection between also what, what you have been inviting us to think about and, and uh, what um, Anita, she, she, was, uh, uh, she was telling us about before you, uh, you arrived, um, I found it very fascinating because this of course was uh, in many ways a lot more, I don't know how I would uh, describe that difference, but uh, in, in, in lack of better words, it's, it's, it's a concrete, uh, kind of more <clears throat> direct scientific uh, uh, presentation of, of, uh, of uh, how to image, or, or what happens when we image, what we can image. So uh, Anita was teaching us about how, for example, to image through using radio waves, and basically being able to to see, I would like in this context, or maybe to use the word sense, uh, sense the world in different ways, and especially sensing elements uh, around us, expanding uh, our reality. Uh, for example, by being uh, looking at uh, how spiders, for example, can uh, understand and sense their world through gravitational fields. I feel I'm a novice, so I'm. Uh, I'm looking uh, frantically at uh, the people who know a lot about this. Um, do I get an A? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> no. 
So anyway, uh, I'd like to move on to, uh, to the Q&A and uh, Karim, he will just uh, move you. I don't know if you can hear me, <laughs> but uh, you are being moved. This is very strange. <coughs> And now you can see, uh, I don't know if you, we can see I the can picture see that you, you see us more or less. Um, so we'll just continue the talk for about, uh, yeah, we'll see, 20 minutes or something like that. It'd be lovely if, uh, if you guys uh, wanted to, uh, to join in with questions or uh, thoughts or comments. Um, the one person we haven't heard from uh, this evening is actually uh, the star of the show. <laughs> Susanna, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's your show that we're here to also, um, or that's kind of creating the context. And of course, this is not what we're sitting in right now, but everybody's been downstairs hopefully to, to, see, uh, to see the show. Um, Susanna, you are the one also who um, proposed to to do to have a conversation with both Anita and uh, and uh, Denise, and maybe first and foremost, you and Denise have been working together for several years now, discussing uh, some of the topics today. Maybe you could just help us out a little bit about how heat and the conversations with Denise and how that figures into the works that you, that you have downstairs. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> no, um, first, uh, thanks so much for all of you being here and also for Denise to join us and for Anita. This, um, this was really uh, a bit of my dream, uh, having, uh, ideally Denise would be here with us, but um, for some short-term changes this didn't happen. Um, it's kind of uh, funny because I thought like, oh my God, what this this all comes together so nicely. Like, uh, you know, Anita talked at the end about astrophysics. Um, astrophysics is like something that uh, me and Denise share as a hobby. Um, uh, Meta Heaven has been looking into quantum physics. Uh, quantum physics is also something that um, we share. So apart from the talks and the inspirations, um, I would say, it's also, it's maybe not so much elemental thinking, but it's maybe experimenting with the elements um, and also with the way that we perceive them and, and the way that we uh, perceive, you know, living or formerly living things, things that are extracted, things that are the jewels, um, to their, to maybe the ways that we haven't seen them. So for me, you know, the elemental is a, a very guiding force in the exhibition down there, but also imagining and imagining technology because otherwise we have no access to, to you know, like to, to uh, I think temperature is a good example, like when you see these cameras that, uh, that show, I think everyone has them on the iPhone where you see heat or the temperature of a person is all this like red it's it's an it's another dimension to kind of like say what what temperature actually is or um how i perceive that so many of these let's say elemental experimentations um in the way uh we live today and the way that we we have to swallow and and deal with violence and also the transformations on the planet um, I'd say that was like a driving force of all the pieces you can see in the exhibition um, some maybe have this like super super clear like the map is a map of a now desert that used to be an ocean this this is you know is one of the most biodiverse deserts that we have on the planet but it actually has once been an ocean and only the camels carry in their DNA um, the real witness of this uh, this having been a transformation so I mean each of the pieces in the in in, in the work uh, in the exhibition I would see like so much of uh, 
the thinking that uh, Denise proposes in my humble little experimentation and also the technologies or the, the accesses to like realms that we don't have access to, uh, let's say, um, through the microscope, through imaging technology, through laser, through the, um, what's it called, the web. Uh, I've actually looked at the um, GEMS web uh, uh, parts in life uh, in my fellowship and, and kind of like because they look like sculpture these parts of that telescope uh, when you in front of it is like these glassy super beautiful sculptures and then it's like the telescope with which you uh, you see what we just saw so anyway in each of the pieces there will be loads of uh, connections to this but to me it's more interesting how much of that can be you know, experienced by you or, you know, how is the experience of a heated room when you're not, when you're not used to that? Um, now I'm spacing off. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but we can also, uh, yeah, move on. But it was a very general question, so I did yeah. say so, because each of the pieces one could, you know, one could talk about why, but in a very, uh, yeah, in a very general way, I'd say uh, I'm also looking for for ways to, to get out of these uh, grids of not only classifications, but there, there comes more with the classifications. The classification actually are like all like one-way streets. And when you want to get away with that, you immediately come to the quantum physics and to, you come to the elemental. So and when you talk about class, uh, classifications, it's it's very you know this animal you know is a camel for example, and this is this is living, this is non-living, those types of classification. I mean, these are the ones that I can talk the best about. Yeah. <laughs> also, just uh, for you guys, if you don't, uh, if you're not acquainted, and you just saw the show quickly, uh, the desert is uh, this also this table that you see when you come down the stairs, the Great Run of Kutch. It has the same shape, um, and it's almost turned into this type of almost uh, sci-fi uh, imaginationary uh, idea or presentation somehow. Um, yeah. Thanks. I'm. Um, I guess I was. It was interesting for me to to hear the way that you. Uh, Denise, when you talked about the uh, heat, I got this idea that you know by understanding that or by looking at the element of heat, uh, also was I was trying to not think of you know the development of climate change, for example, in a in a usual temporal you know context. It started with the industrial age, and then now it's uh, uh, it's kind of moving more and more towards a point where the world will end, you know, somehow this is kind of our imagination of, of uh, climate change and, and uh, kind of the end of the world. But, but I guess it's, you were also talking about, you know, transformation and thinking about heat uh, as, as this energy where you can kind of trace transformation and you were coupling it to capital. And I was interested in also, because suddenly I was starting to think about capital also as or how, I mean, is it an element suddenly? I mean, this, this accumulation, what happens when we, when, we, uh, when we, through labor and through industry, uh, you know, create a lot of energy and we create heat and so on, and, and, and these, this process is somehow also stored within, I guess, financial institutions somehow as something. Maybe you could uh, you could say a little bit about that. Um, yes, thank you, Carl. Um, well, let me uh, first say that your summary of what I said was really excellent. Thank you. And um, so, the, yeah, it, it, it allows me to, I think, make some things, uh, say some things that will make the connection to your question about capital accumulation, what capital accumulation has to do with heat. Um, so, 
And that if it works, in, it works at two levels at the same time. So may, it's very complex. So I'll try not to make it so complicated because it's so complex. But um, in, re, in regards to now, going, first going back to to your to, to your excellent summary, um, that um, I think the the meditating on the uh, paying attention to heat and meditating on it or speculating. With it has to do with um, with trying to open up the possibility for thinking not only without without human time without universal time not only the historic historically but also more importantly scientifically right so because that is I mean if we just follow the division in in, in modern philosophy the scientific is the source of our language for talking about anything other, anything that is not human. Um, so that is that is that, and this is important to think about capital. So uh, I'll go back there. Now, that effort has to do with two. I think two displacements, displacing two things. On the one hand, um, treating the human as something that uh, as an existent. Right, as something that exists, and what, and then uh, stuff that that takes place as something that happens. So it's not so much then about being human, but about talking about the human as something that exists. Not only, and then in making that shift, it's not talking about the human as something that exists in the world, but right, and then keeping. In doing so, keeping some possibility that the human is something else that is not of, of this world, but but treating and addressing and speaking about the human as an existent is about also treating the human as something of this world, like everything else, and so not in the world, but of it. Um, um, and then, of course, you know the as you, you, you said, that has a lot. To Something happens to what we call objects, objects of science, uh, or objects that in, in that place in, the, in relation to the human. In that, so it's not so much about treating what exists or what happens as object, but just you know as attending to different modalities of appearance of of presentation. I should say not appearance, because then gets into the scientific. Of presentation of you know the same basic stuff that is uh, that transforms. So now going back to the to heat and uh, and capital accumulation. Um, so heat heat is transfer, right? Heat is transfer of internal kinetic energy from one thing to another. That's what it's already in the name of a process of be, something becoming part of something else, something becoming something else. And two things not being fundamentally fully separated, as in so far as heat, you know, as you know, and then since everything vibrates at the radiates at the infrared, so you know we, we do this. Um, so then we were saying we are like all these red dots walking around, so we can ex ex you know further speculate from from that, but but yeah, so. The key in, in terms of capital accumulation, to me, is precisely that. Not thinking, thinking with heat is out because the thinking with heat also allows us to think with labor, which is again a transfer. Labor is the name of a transfer of potential energy. So something that labor does, labor is transferring its internal kinetic and internal uh, potential, its potential energy. To something else, right? To something else that is, you know, coming out of, of labor. So, thinking, so we can take, you know, Marx's equation of value, and displace the human as the source of value, and consider all the, the stuff that enters in, in that in that equation, including the raw materials, as you know, that energy as participating in that transfer. Of course, the human is there. As part of the as part of the process, but it's not the determining element in the process. And and then if, and then so if labor, <laughs> not human labor, 
not labor, power to labor, the doing of that transformation, that, that transformation, the taking place of that transformation is uh, the source of value, is that which determines value, exchange, the exchange value of the commodity, which is then you know, sold in the market and generating, that generates profit that is further um, uh, invested as capital, so that, that profit, whether it's realized as money or whether it's realized as machinery, uh, whether it's realized as wage, it's, made, it's the same, trans you see, it's something that becomes possible from the same, that transfer of energy of everything, including obviously the human body that is participating in that process. And when you no longer have human bodies, and then I you know, was thinking of that labor, for instance, the, the Marxist concept of that labor. So what you have that is not that labor, but it's you know, it's just a you know a presentation of of the energy of the labor that was um, that entered in, in in all the different things that come to produce the machine where you know Marx finds finds that that labor. So yeah, so that's why also the phase transition is a good, you know, it's a good image for, for that. So you go from the body in a solid, in, as a solid presentation to, you know, to money as an abstract one, one of the, of, with an air quality. And you trace the transformation of that, of the same stuff. Uh, it's not the th same thing, it's the same stuff. So this is, you know, the kind of speculation that I'm interested in. Um, the things that we know that we can describe differently once we displace the humans. So in, in Marx, you know, in the, in the Marxist analysis of capital, we displace the human as the cause, the efficient cause. And it's only because, you know, this privileged position the human occupied in, you know, in 19th century philosophy that it plays that role in historical materialism. If we displace the human and look at the same process, um, mm. and so what happens without thinking about mm. all of it? Thank you. We can uh, try to keep that, uh, keep that thought in our mind <clears throat> throughout. Um, Anita, I would like to, to, to call you in because one thing I was thinking of during uh, Denise's presentation was also how we develop these machines or these extrasensory machines basically to, to, to see things that we can't already see. And it seems to me that you also have this very strong fascination with with what we can do with not only science, but also with microscopy and, and, and making these, yeah, basically machines. So, so for example, do you, do you know of also technologies and machines where, where we can imagine, you know, seeing uh, like the elements, like, uh, like Denise was talking about, like heat and so on, as more of kind of an, everyday experience somehow or something that is that can become a, a closer part of our way of, of thinking. I'm not sure actually, but uh, I want to say something a bit uh, about um, your work and Denise's uh, presentation and what I did. I think uh, for me, the takeaway message uh, for tonight, uh, one of them is that with the human condition and the climate change and your work and what I'm saying is that we don't see more than what's in front of us. Like the indifference comes from not being able to see, to understand. And uh, it's very fascinating because we're like, even in this room, it's full of information, like scientifically, it's heat, I don't know, what is your body temperature changing? I don't know what that wall is made of. And I don't care, that creates indifference. And imagine, and with the meditation, what it does, I feel like it connects us a bit more with what we can't, with what we don't, we do not know and what we cannot see. 
I don't find this common ground of like the seeing should not be just what's in front of you to because that makes you that makes it what you care about. Mm. Has, but also with, with your work, has that changed? Feel like the way that you see the world since that you have started to work yes. with uh, with imaging. Yes, it has. In which way? Like for example, with the um, uh, for, um, there are methods that they. Uh, measure how your body changes uh, with like temperature differences in the body and uh, when you experience different feelings so when I'm angry or experiencing sadness I can I see those images in my head and it becomes mm -hmm. much more controllable and once something really crazy happens because uh, you can tell your brain about like what's happening in your body if you are like focused enough and uh, I had this like super sore throat <laughs> for some uh, days and then I was just like, I put my hand on my throat and I started to imagine the cells in my, in my throat <laughs> and just uh, was like communicating this message that nothing has happened, you, I'm just ill and literally my sore throat went away. I know this is like super crazy but uh, mm. I don't think it's that crazy because um, uh, the things that we don't see in our body still exist. I don't think people even know, I don't know my own body or my emotions that deeply still. That's super interesting how, um, for example, also with heat sensing, being aware yeah. of changes in body temperature, for example, from different emotions or something yeah. like that. And how uh, by being trained or taught to, to see other things, uh, actually can uh, becomes part of our brain or part of our imaging or yeah our internal in imaging somehow yeah I don't know if that if, if that in any way translates into art do you think when you're talking about like when you work and when you make a work uh, you're putting something out there also you're also offering some kind of uh, thought system or a connection between objects and so on which I guess also at some point will, like, hopefully could, could implant some, uh, some new ways of thinking for, for people who see it. I don't know if you have any, like, that type of ethos <laughs> in, uh, in your thoughts. And also please uh, join in if you guys uh, have a comment. Just raise your hand and I'll call it. Um, yeah, definitely. I would be really interested uh, uh, if there's questions or comments in the audience, but uh, to your question, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think this is um, this is also what many artists are, are, are trying to, I think one of the last documentaries called it unlearning, but that, that we, you know, you try to approach a material in a different way before. You know, what happens if you just put like this little seat on the table down there? Which is actually a seed that can stop the desert. It's a plant that can you know, stop erosion, and uh, so it is. It's a very uh, um, nearly holy plant for for some people because it has this like superpower. But when you just see it on the table, it looks like you know someone didn't clean up the table. So I am definitely interested in experimenting with this. What well, what happens if you just look at the seed in this, you know, power? power that this tiny little thing is, then people are like lost because they don't, they, they think maybe, oh, this is like leftover and, and so on, put it on the, uh, that's maybe, it, it's not so much experimenting in the exhibition then, but it's like more um, uh, experimenting with what if we take it away that the plant is only what it is when it is grown. I mean, this is a bit of a cheesy example, but, uh, Definitely, I, I think definitely, because we, we have so many things that are seen in a very violent or in a very one-dimensional way, and how do you get away from that as an artist? Uh, Expand on, on the violence of seeing things in, in one form or in one way, please. Mm. I mean, with the exhibition, it's... Uh, is the easiest example yeah, or again the camel nose maybe 
you know, the, the camera nose is like a, it, it's like a crazy technology. It's, it's the, the, and, but we look at the nose as, oh, there's the nose. And like you were saying, the, most of the information that we take in actually comes through the nose. It's just that not all of it can cognitively end up in a drawer there. And this is maybe where I see like some potentials or I've worked with smell before or um, I try to see what happens if you take a breathing camel nose and then people are really, you know, trying to figure out what's this wobbly thing on there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's where I would say like it materializes what, the, what these uh, thoughts or maybe one way streets don't allow me. Mm. And I would even I would say it's an urgency. Would you like to comment on that, Dennis? I see you taking notes. Me? Yeah, yeah. Would you like to comment on that? I see you taking notes. I uh, know. I was. Um, I just took notes. Uh, well, number one, I wish I wish I could have heard to listen to what Anita. So I'm really curious about about your work. Um, Try to learn more. No, I was just wondering, and uh, uh, Susanna was saying, said about the, most of the information coming through the nose. And um, so thinking, yeah, what does it mean? Because um, so our, our, our ocular centrism, our vision, <laughs> visual centric ways have a lot to do with distance, right? I mean, it's all related to how to abstraction and, and distance. But um, but well, the sense of smell that is also distance, but that is something else. That's a distance from, but then that is also the mediation of everything. The air is a mediator in that sense. You see, so I just start to think, huh? <laughs> let's see how we can, where we can take it <laughs> in terms of you know, um, even if the information is not resolved, but if as a, a leader was saying if we just pay attention to that what you know what ships can be brought but I I didn't yeah I did not go in <laughs> no but, but it's you call you, you asked me <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I'll take responsibility so, for that do you have a question or was it just a reaction no oh, okay yeah please we have a, a question and I'll uh, if you can't hear it I'll uh, oh that's a microphone maybe you can hear it Yes. Hello. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much to the uh, four of you. Actually, it's been a, an amazing talk, and I just, I was wondering also because I was also trying to connect kind of the dots about the, um, the presentations and the art. So, my question is rather simple. It's uh, we've talked about decentering the human, and like uh, Denise, you said, like the human is a contestable category, in in many ways. But I, I'm wondering, what technology? does in the sense for this decolonial kind of approaches to search for both environmental and social justice. And I was just thinking about how the body, right? We're talking about the body and the heat and this idea of the Lucian kind of sense and, you know. So my question is, is that, like, what does technology, digital uh, media, what does this do for social and environmental justice? Could you hear any, any of that, uh, Denise? Uh, I think I understood the question. What can technology do for social environmental justice? Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Like, Especially thinking about like technology instead be becomes part of this paradigm, this Western epistemology. So how does that work of decentering? I mean, with the master's tools, like putting also uh, Audre Lorde. So that's what I was thinking with your, with your talk. Um, I may not have got all, yeah, the details of your question, so I'm sorry if I don't uh, respond to precisely what you have in mind or if my response, and I know it doesn't, doesn't work if I ask you again because I know I'm going to miss the, <laughs> the key, um, the key part of it. Um, I don't, but anyway, I don't know, you see, the, Technology, um, we can think of it in, in instrumental ways, and then if, if, if you know the, the gadgets are there to be used towards doing things, 
they, you know, that are, they may, as technology to does, you know, allow us to do some things that we don't, that are not, we don't think possible or that are not possible. If that's how we treat them, right, in terms of, um, of efficacy. Um, that is of, of obviously the, the black mirror nightmare in which the techno world just turns the human into, you know, into a slave. But that's not the conversation we are having. So that's, and I'm saying, but I'm saying that because, you know, black mirror is a critique of the human and the, and the human, human intervention in the world, etc., etc. But then just repeat some old tropes. Um, so when I think about when I think with, when I bring considerations of the tech, of technology and thinking of the gadgets, whether the, the mechanical solid ones or the virtual electronic electronic ones that we have, I'm I'm usually I'm usually bringing them in terms of what if we will actually look at the machines that are available to us to do things. We, we can actually, we can touch and see the operations of, of the colonial in them, in terms of, you know, the, the materials, the conditions of, of possibility for having access to the materials that enter in, in, in the composition. So that's the, the first question that I ask of technology, right? If I pay attention to my computer, to everything that's allowing me to have this conversation with you, including the satellites up there, you know, I, I will definitely have, to, you know, if I pay attention to it, if I think of the, the copper that is here in the computer and the gold that may be there in the satellite, it immediately connects to, you know, the what, the, the colonial violence, the instances of colonial violence in the Amazon in Brazil. Uh, in the, around the extraction of gold and the copper and the Katanga mining in, in, in the DRC. So whatever we do with technology, <laughs> we have to bring the whole beast, right, <laughs> into, into consideration and, um, and then ask the question then of, the question of, you know, what, what can it do? What can we do with it, basically, I think, so. And what we should not do. But again, I have to say that I missed, I think I missed something key in the question. So. Yeah, what do you feel uh, just add to the that it was yeah, answered? Yeah, I think it's an open-ended uh, question yeah. in many ways, like how to think of technology for people on traditional purposes. Also, can I just add this, that I, the common sense about uh, this feeling that most of the people have about science, it actually comes from the military, uh, because this is all. Um, that it has the answer for everything and science is technology because science is a method of thinking. It's not actually technology. It's like creating knowledge in a way. But uh, so if it is related to the military, it has everything to do with the society. Because technology is used for power. But that's the beauty of it, Anita, because it's not only the military, so the military now, but if we think about all, you know, the, everything that was possible because Galileo was working towards mm -hmm. making navigation more efficient, mm -hmm. and the whole transformation of, that gives us science, it was connected to the colonial, to the conquest and the colonization of the Americas, right? I mean, that, that's, it's always, it's always being connected to some yeah. kind of deployment of, uh, of violence from the very beginning. Um, so, anyway. And the fundings of the project, even now, is mainly based on the, what to, every time you give a presentation in scientific conferences, it's like, what is the application? What is the technology? It's like, can we just be curious for like five minutes? <laughs> Instead of having a product out there that can create something or do something. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Uh, I started my answer thinking about if it is about what we can do with the thing, right? We yeah. build the machine towards doing something, right? Yeah. Then the, it's not necessarily invest, you know, associate, attached to anything. It's not like that. If we use 
a machine to the computer for the you know, decolonization doesn't mean that it will work against it. But what we can't forget is that the colonial mechanisms that make the computer available for the struggle anyway, right? So this is what we sometimes we do forget. Um, yeah. There's another question here, Karim. If you uh, had the microphone over there. Um, Maybe help us out and keep it brief, and then I can try and, uh, and translate it. Unfortunately, the sound is impossible to... Oh, yeah, this is on. Um, okay, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, thank you for an interesting talk. Okay, um, keeping this brief is difficult. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I had a thought about... Um, the kind of the core of this talk has been the intersection between... Uh, using technologies in order to allow us to imagine things that we cannot otherwise sense, uh, while also working towards perspectives on the world that decenter uh, humanity. And I'm curious if you have any views on how that uh, carries with it the risk of uh, ignoring ideologies embedded into these technologies. Um, and how this, if we are decentering the human in our perspective, but we are accepting these technologies as perspectives on the world, then are we not uh, at great risk of ignoring the things that are built into these technologies in various ways? Um, this was uh, to Denise or to everybody? I don't know how much of that you got, uh, Denise. Did you? Did I, got, I, yes, I got the end of uh, the question, which I think you know, if we are on the risk of ignoring, um, I will be brief, and then I'll let everybody else speak. Since you know, you, you asked me, Carl. I think we, I think, are paying attention to uh, you know the the both the you know the the mechanisms of actual violence and then. The, the, of you know partial violence, the ideological or you know, whatever you you call those that are connected to the technologies. That's what we can do because I mean that's what we maybe no not must do, but that something that what we we should do. <laughs> um, because I don't think because there is no there is nothing that is not. In, you know, involved, invested <laughs> in, in it, right? I mean, I'm, I'm talking, I'm using the computer to talk to you anyway. So I think my, my, my main issue is with the, uh, uh, pretending that, that is, we are innocent somehow, that anyone is innocent, right? Um, that we are, that we have found a way of doing it, of doing things completely separate from this inheritance we, we have. Um, so if we begin acknowledging that and make all the decisions around whatever it is that we are doing as attempts not to reinforce or repeat that violence, then maybe, I don't know, but maybe. Do you uh, want to comment? Technology. Sorry. <laughs> no, the, the point is not, is not to say that uh, there's an easy way out with, the, with some future technology. So this, uh, this, I think we all agree. So no matter what technology, I, you know, in lectures I usually say that the internet is the same like the hammer. You can build a house or you can, uh, you know, dish someone in the head. It, this is all possible. And I... I mean, for me, with the four years at NTNU, I, I think it's, it's more that our brains are always taking all this ideology for granted. And the point is rather, how can you pay attention to all these ideologies in there? But I don't know if this answered your question. <laughs> Not really. No, I also wanted to just comment uh, that I think it's a very good and understandable um, 
question and thought, but, and, but it also runs this risk of um, what I would call like purist apathy, in the sense that we um, we end up in a cul-de-sac very often. You know, when I think you you said something beautiful, Denise. Um, you know, like trying to unthink the world or imagine the end of the world. Or is, is this for me at least? I I. Uh, the way that my brain works or the categorizations that are happening is also that, I mean, you are kind of working with the, with the technology of, of thought somehow, you know, what is, what is possible for us to imagine. And I found it really interesting when I was hearing your talk because it was, it was both very stimulating, but it was also somewhere else on kind of working with the technology of imaging. And so what, what is possible for us to imagine um, and then from, and that's not the same as what does that mean that we go out and, and create right away because there are all these obstacles and, and things are complicated and life is complicated and we are wrong most of the time and we are like, uh, so there's a lot of these things but, but I really like this idea of the possibilities of imagining, you know, unthinking the world or, you know, once in a while meditating uh, on, on the copper and the gold <laughs> and where that comes from uh, instead of uh, stressing about writing that email that we need to write something like that. Um, and at least for me, I, I believe that it's, uh, it's kind of in the intersection between thinking and, and, and uh, or meditating and, and, and acting that we make things uh, better if, uh, if you want to, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, I think we're gonna kind of uh, wrap it up. Thank you. <laughs> wrap it up uh, for this evening. Um, unless there's the last uh, someone sitting with a comment they really want to say. Also, the speakers here, or the, the people in the in the panel, that are, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. please let us know if you have any last comments. No. Good. Then Thank I'm. You. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Then I just want to extend my gratitude to everybody who is here, both uh, the, the the people who uh, who are joining us from abroad, people who came tonight to present all the stuff that they know. Thank you, much, uh, thank, thank you so much to Susan for both kind of helping organizing this and, and also for, uh, for the, the show that uh, is um, um, letting us grow all these new ideas. And of course, thank you so much to you guys for taking time out. Uh, giving your Netflix a rest and uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, getting your brain massaged in a different way tonight. So thanks a lot for coming and uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>